All right, YouTube, right now everyone and their mother is talking about this Malaysian Airlines flight that got downed over Ukraine. Uh, we're getting a better picture of what seems to have happened right now. The, I mean, the first few hours after it happened, nobody had a clue what was going on. Uh, some media outlets were saying it crashed. Uh, fairly innocuous, you know, well, it fell out of the sky and, you know, exploded. Others were saying it was shot down. Uh, some people were saying the Ukrainians shot it down, uh, mistaking it for Putin's plane. Some were saying the rebels shot it down, mistaking it for a, a Ukrainian fighter uh, or bomber or something. And then some people were saying, oh, the Russians probably shot it down as a response to sanctions. Uh, it now looks like the most likely scenario is that the, the Ukrainian rebels, the ones that are fighting against the government, uh, were the ones that shot it down. Originally, it wasn't clear it had been shot down. It looked like there was also the possibility that it simply exploded in transit and then scattered around. Uh, there was some sort of fuel leak or something. However, when it was claimed that it was shot down, what if it weren't the case that it was, if the rebels didn't shoot this plane down first, you wouldn't have expected to see them talking about at the same time that this plane went down on Twitter actually talking about uh, downing uh, what they thought was a military craft. Uh, secondly, the Ukrainian military denies that it even has the capability of firing on, a, on uh, an airplane that's that high at that high altitude. I think we can probably debate whether that's actually the case. I'm sure they've got weapons that are undeclared like everyone else does. Uh, but they, I mean, ultimately, they wouldn't really have a reason. But the rebels were talking about on Twitter shooting down a, a military craft. These tweets and this other content was quickly deleted when this story came out. I think what seems to have happened uh, is this was a, a terrible mistake on their part, and they actually thought it was some sort of Ukrainian military craft. Um, that seems to be the case. And also... Uh, if it weren't shot down by the rebels or by somebody on that side, you would expect to see probably the Russians and or these rebels uh, saying that it wasn't shot down from the get-go. What you have is them denying that they were the ones responsible, but so far nobody has come out and said it wasn't shot down. You would expect, I would, I would expect to see more people proclaiming that it wasn't shot out of the sky, if indeed it wasn't. I would expect these people would say, hold on a second, uh, this craft could have just exploded in the air and crashed on its own. So far, I'm not seeing anyone uh, discounting the idea that it was actually fired upon, so I'm going to assume that that's probably the case. Then you can get into all the false flag stuff. Well, you know, the Ukrainians decided to false flag the, the rebels so that they would have a prelude to go smash them. Or maybe the Russians shot it down because they got tired of dealing with the rebels and just want them to go away. Or the US government was false flagging the Russians uh, so we can sanction them more. You, what you do have right now, though, are a lot of people uh, focusing on the Putin connection saying, well, Russia's ultimately responsible. Part of me agrees with this, uh, because Putin has been arming these groups. Clearly he has. They couldn't have gotten a hold of these weapons if they weren't being supplied by Russia. The Ukrainian military does not use some of the weapons that they are using. They got them from somewhere. Who'd they get them from? It's fairly obvious. There's nowhere else they could have gotten them other than from Mother Russia. So part of me says, well, that's kind of true. I mean, Putin's giving them these weapons, these surface terror missiles. They're using them. They've now fired on, uh, wrongfully fired upon a craft that had nothing to do with the, the problems going on there. But the other part of me recognizes something else. The U.S. is doing essentially the same thing right now in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, we are arming groups like the FSA, giving them heavy weaponry. I don't care how many people try to tell me, oh, we're only giving them medical aid and money. Well, what do you, first, what are they doing with the money? And second, if you think that all we're giving them is old combat helmets and, and band-aids, then you don't have two marbles rolling around in your head. Of course we're giving them heavy weapons. We're just funneling them through Saudi Arabia like we've always done in the past. And now the Saudis have fortified their own border because they realize that these same groups that they've been arming for the United States have turned on them. 
Uh, or it's just a show, you know, to say, oh, well, yeah, we're fortifying our border because we're worried too. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Couldn't be us that's funding them because we're worried. Just look at how scared we are. They haven't attacked Saudi Arabia yet anyway. But we're essentially doing basically the same thing in the Middle East that Russia is doing in eastern Ukraine. I think both sides have lost their mind because Russia is now arming groups of ragtag ban and probably giving them you know various training and, and things beyond simply weaponry is arming the, these ragtag groups of Eastern European rebels. Uh, we know what happens when such militant groups take hold in that region. They get co-opted by organized crime. They turn into strong men after the fighting is done, and then you have more problems down the road. In the Middle East, where the United States is currently arming people, what seems to happen over and over again throughout history is that whenever we arm somebody, whenever we back somebody, they quickly turn those weapons around and use them against us or our allies. It's a losing game. These proxy wars that are being waged between Russia and its interests and the United States and its interests uh, ultimately have failed completely. Usually, it gives you a short-term gain. You know, the United States makes a short-term gain in the Middle East and then gets completely ass-blasted. The Russians have suffered the same fate. The Chinese now for their sort of interventionism in certain parts of the world are now starting for the first time to suffer serious terrorist attacks. You know, you call it terrorism, separatism, uh, any of these other terms, some people call them freedom fighters if they happen to agree with them. Uh, these proxy wars and these sort of conflicts that are armed by the big boys, the US and its close allies in the EU especially, and then, of course, Russia, and then the Chinese are sort of more of a neutral party. They're kind of coming out and condemning Russia right now, and they've sort of turned their backs on North Korea. I am of the mind that the Chinese are swinging more towards the Western sphere because they realize how much business they do and that the economies of the West are simply better able to absorb their goods, uh, not stopping them from getting gas from Russia, though. But uh, they lean towards the East, at least for the moment. But what you see over and over is these groups turn their back on the same people who are arming and funding them, and then they attack them as well, if it fits their interests. Uh, I think it's too early right now to say whether Putin was involved at all. He's obviously armed these groups, but it, ultimately, is Russia responsible for the actions of rebel groups if, as they claim, they are simply giving them arms? And, and Putin has been ambiguous on this as well. I would say no. What would be more damning is if the people in command of some of these rebel groups, which seem to have attacked this airliner, are actually Russian. They're actually literally from the Russian services. They're over there as advisors. That would be far more damning. The problem is we have some evidence that that's the case, but we can't prove it. We have a hunch. We have a suspicion. Is that proof? No. Uh, there's good reason to believe it, but you need something more solid than just, well, I believe that the Russians are, are not only arming, but actually giving training and logistic support to these people. And again, I would point out the United States did the same thing in Vietnam before we ever put, you know, uh, our own actual soldiers on the ground. We had already sent troop advisors there under Eisenhower. Uh, the things that are going on in Ukraine right now are deeply destabilizing. You've got, I marginally support the government in Kiev. I think people got tired of their, their corrupt regime. A lot of people have this sort of delusion. And this is a delusion I've seen both among those that claim that the Jews are running the world and the Masons, the Illuminati, New World Order, bankers, uh, all of these different groups. Every time that I hold a conversation with these people. They are deluded into the belief that only the United States and the West are controlled by whatever group they happen to be referencing, sometimes more than one group. They don't seem to understand that Russia fits right in with that same system. It's no different. It's just the flip side of the same status totalitarian coin. It's no different. If they say, well, the Jews control the world, I say, okay, United States has a heavy-handed heavy APAC action in the U.S. political system. I'll give you that. 
What about the oligarchs that back Putin with all of their money, the industrial barons and so forth? What, what religion do you think they're members of? They're all from former Khazaria. Uh, <laughs> what about the bankers? They say, well, the, the central banking system is corrupt and running everything. They say, well, the West is controlled by that. But Putin's a god man. He'll save us from that. I say, what's Russia, what's Russia trying to do right now? It's trying to form along with China and Brazil and India and South Africa to form their own banking conglomerate. What do you think they'll be doing? Is it going to be any different? Do you think they're suddenly going to stop... Uh, stop giving out bad loans to people and and uh, crushing them under debt not while there's a profit to be made and I don't care how nationalistic Putin supposedly is I don't really look at him that way but even if Putin is a nationalist and cares about the Russian people which I think is highly debatable and I think it would depend on what ethnic group you're talking about in Russia certainly not the Chechens or Kamchatkins or people of, of Ukrainian descent necessarily uh, if you look <clears throat> at Putin and say, well, he'll save us, he's a great man, he's having rivals poisoned with radioactive elements, arming these rebels that have now attacked a civilian airliner, I look at him and I say he's no different than anyone like Obama or Bush. He's no different. The Russians invaded Georgia. Uh, the Russians uh, are in Crimea right now after a dubious referendum. Uh, that, that uh, even their own government service there accidentally gave a real report on and it showed that less than half the population bothered to vote. The margin of victory for those who wanted to secede from Ukraine was like 1%. Then they quickly took it down. Uh, but it was there. It's no less corrupt. Uh, people in the 50s, I think, were more intelligent than people today. People back then, they knew that the government here in the United States, they knew about McCarthy. They knew about all this shit. They knew that the government was spying on people. They knew that the government was doing things that was underhanded. But that didn't suddenly make them support Russia and become communists or say praise Stalin or move to China or any of these other things. They didn't suddenly grow this delusion that there has to be a, a cut and dry black and white good guy, bad guy scenario. What you have today is, is a bilateral world in which both of these two sides, the West, the, the more philosophically advanced nations, the United States, the EU, the NATO partners, the Australians, Canada, and so forth, the, the, the Japanese, some of our allies in, in Latin America and Africa, versus the East, which is the Russians and their general former sphere, these states that were former Soviet, parts of Eastern Europe, the Serbians to a marginal extent. Again, countries in Africa, the Venezuelans, the Cubans, uh, China, along with its sort of satellites, and North Korea, of course. They try to lean on the Vietnamese, but the Vietnamese uh, have started to hate the Chinese, so I think that's a lost cause for, the, for China there. Uh, what you have is this world that's split between these two sides. And there is no clear-cut good guy, because both sides are abusing their populations. I see people here in the United States, they say, well, especially among the right wing, the right wing is disastrously harming itself by engaging in this sort of rhetoric with somebody as unhinged as Putin at the helm of Russia. They say, well, over here we're just given over to, you know, there's gay marriage and abortion and everything's degeneracy, it's moral decay. But look at Russia, he's finally cracking, Putin's cracking down on this shit. So they're basically saying, well, maybe Russia's actually better. This is a former communist nation that honestly does have enough nuclear weapons to severely hamper human development on, in this world, in which you have a, a, a leader, Putin, who has invaded other countries. He invaded Georgia, a member of the KGB formerly, uh, and they're saying that somehow Putin is good and that the United States is evil. And then you have other people who say, well, the United States is great, fuck the Russians, Putin is horrible. I'll support my own government no matter what it does because I'm supposedly a patriot, even though our government's just as abusive. There is no good guy in this struggle. The good guys in this struggle are countries that are largely remaining isolated and neutral and don't give a damn. We're talking about maybe the Swiss, some of the Scandinavian countries that really don't care. They may be in NATO or, or the EU or whatever, but ultimately they're largely pacifistic. We're talking about third world nations that don't have standing militaries. We're talking about some of the micro nations. These are the nations that are actually peaceable. 
The United States and Russia have been playing this game of chess since the end of World War II. Personally, I think if Patton had had it his way, he would have invaded Russia right off. They never would have gotten nuclear weapons and probably would have been crushed and balkanized by now. Uh, unfortunately, Patton was not able to do that. I think that the, the Cold War, the, inner, the sort of paranoia revolving around weapons of mass destruction and espionage and all of these things, hacking and, and sabotage and all these things, the, the sort of James Bond stuff that you talk about. I think has done more to hamper this world than anything else in our history. We've got these two sides that are lined up and they both end up having to abuse their own domestic population to keep a hold of things and to try to, uh, to outdo the other side. This can only end in one of a few ways, by the way. There are only a few ways that the Cold War can actually end. We've severely limited, we can't simply fight it out without using weapons of mass destruction. It will never happen. We can either unload our nukes on one another and wipe each other out. One side can develop technology removing the other side's second strike capabilities, invade and remove their nuclear weapons by force, and by then that state will probably be totalitarian, so it'll be even worse uh, than a world-ending scenario. Or the two sides can get together, smoke a bong, go hippy-trippy mode with Yoko and John, uh, and try to get rid of these weapons. The problem being then there are all of these other states that have proliferated these weapons as well, uh, so that's not going to happen. Really, the Cold War can only end in cataclysm. There's no way for it to, to go otherwise. Otherwise, it just stretches, it, or it can stretch on forever. The Cold War can continue, uh, and both sides can continue to build more and more sophisticated weapons and grind down their own people with surveillance and hack each other and, and do various things to hamper one another's progress or they can nuke each other, or one side can finally develop the means to remove the other side's second strike capabilities. There's really no other options. The military industrialists in bo on both sides, both the Russia and the United States, and their various uh, partners and friends, are not simply going to say, yeah, it's time to end the Cold War, let's go back to farming. They're not going to do that. There's too much money wrapped up in it. So at some point, I expect fully that because of a mistake or some terrorist action or a coup or sabotage there will be a nuclear war and it will end most of the life on this planet the only other option is that one side has developed the ability to prevent the other side from being able to launch in retaliation and it will still require the destruction of that nation either through uh, a regular warfare or through nuclear warfare something along those lines if the united states develops the anti-missile systems it's talking about now, the ones that are literally lasers, uh, that can simply rip a missile apart seconds after it launches. If those are developed and successfully deployed, if, they te if they're tested and they work, and they're put around Russia in Japan, in South Korea, Taiwan, uh, possibly India or Pakistan, might order some, Turkey, uh, some of these European nations, uh, especially northern Canada, because nukes would actually be launched uh, across the pole into the United States. If that happens, the Russians lose. They'll no longer be able to launch a secondary strike. It, it would allow the United States to do basically whatever they want. Uh, the Chinese would be contained as well. We have assets around China. All of these other countries, they'd be powerless. The United States would technically rule the world. Uh, the problem being... If you have two superpowers going at it, for, from, a, from an ethical angle and a philosophical angle, if you have two superpowers going at it, they're going to grind down their own populations because they think that outdoing the other side is more important than their own freedom and welfare. But if one side takes over and becomes the sole superpower, the same thing happens. The other side gets decimated, and the side that now has the power, there's no restraint on its totalitarianism. There's no longer any way for the people to, to potentially petition their government without worrying about being abused. The fact that the Cold War has existed has opened a can of worms on this planet that I believe the best possible outcome is for it to end in cataclysm. Because the other outcomes are actually worse than a nuclear war. The, can't people see this? It's, it's gone completely apeshit. It's like a chess game where you can't actually stop playing. If you stop playing, you get shot in the head. 
And so you have to wrangle around over and over, trying not to destroy all... You're trying not to win in a way. In a way, you almost don't want to win. Because then, then you just end up sitting there alone for the rest of eternity, sobbing on the empty chessboard. Uh, it's crazy. When we developed nuclear weapons, we made a huge mistake. When we deployed them on Japan, I would say that was an even worse mistake. And while I support my country's founding ethos, the government is not thinking sensibly. And this flight that was downed threatens to push us back deeper into a Cold War or towards a World War III scenario, which will eventually happen. It will. Eventually, the nukes will probably fly. Uh, it's likely. Uh, the, there were people who talked about on some of these scientific sites, talking about how unlikely it was uh, that, uh, that in an, any given time span, a world-ending asteroid or a supervolcano or something would happen. They said that the biggest threat was still nuclear war. Why? Because pe nature is violent, nature is chaotic. Usually you get some sort of prediction on when it's going to blow and kill you off. With humans, it's, it's a lot less likely that you're going to get any warning. Tomorrow you could hear an air raid siren and see a mushroom cloud. You probably wouldn't get any warning. And millions or billions of people would die and the rest of the world would be irradiated for the next century. Uh, and when things like this happen, which is the result of proxy war, which Russia is, is waging in Ukraine, and which the United States is uh, waging in the Middle East, when you get these proxy conflicts, a first world nation might be capable of controlling its weapons, to control its nuclear stockpile, to make sure that biological agents don't get out. What about these small rebel groups that keep being armed by the two sides? Do you honestly trust the Free Syrian Army or the Ukrainian rebels with this type of weaponry, there's, they're unhinged. There's nothing to prevent them from using it against anyone they want to. They make mistakes. They don't have the kind of logistic support that a first world nation has. They're not even a nation. They're just rebels. And most of the time, they're not even fighting for any good purpose. They're just butchering people. The Free Syrian Army uh, is using, you know, chlorine bombs all the time in Syria, and then all we hear in the media is how bad Assad is, the rebels are even worse. All the Russian media talks about is how these separatist rebels are great people and they're fighting these horrible, butcherous Ukrainian government forces. Uh, and then and all we see is these same rebels going through the streets randomly firing their guns off. These people are lunatics. So I'd say we can't solidly link this to Russia other than they think that it was a Russian made uh, surface to air missile system that was used. Uh, it was probably the rebels. But I think this is the natural result of proxy conflict anyway. It's going to keep happening. It's spreading all over the world. Libya's in turmoil right now. Libya's being thrown into chaos again. Israel has invaded Gaza. They're planning to send more troops into Gaza. Meanwhile, the media doesn't even talk about all the little kids that are getting killed in Gaza because nobody apparently cares about Palestine. There are four kids sitting on a beach and all of a sudden they started getting shelled. They were just hanging. They weren't even near any buildings. Apparently rebels were in the area. Well, how close? Were they 10 blocks away and the Israelis just missed? Uh, and these Ukrainian rebels and the government forces are just butchering one another and civilians on a constant basis. The world is falling into chaos. We're probably closer to a nuclear war right now than we were during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And people are too dumb to realize it. Uh, people say, oh, well, it can never happen. Well, there were people that said it couldn't happen back then, and it almost did. There was an incident where the U.S. Air Force accidentally dropped a hydrogen bomb in North Carolina. That didn't go off. It wasn't fully armed or something like that. and didn't explode. If it had, it would have killed hundreds of thousands of people and irradiated half of the state. And it almost went off. They accidentally bombed, almost bombed our own country. There was a case in the 70s where they were running an anti-missile simulation, sort of a nuclear exchange simulator. They accidentally broadcast it to all of the computers in, in their little control center. And these people were convinced that it was actually a, a real Russian nuclear launch. They were hot and ready to go and ready to press the little red button. And this is the 70s. That's not that long ago. Jimmy Carter was the president. He was a pacifist. And it almost happened. 
Uh, this is madness. And what if these nuclear systems get hacked? What if somebody manages to use the same technology groups like the NSA use to hack into the nuclear grid of Russia, the United States, Britain, France, even North Korea? If they hacked into their systems and gave false orders. Pakistan and India, you think that they're using developed modern servers to control their systems? They probably still use uh, old cassette tapes uh, to run those computers. They're, they're in the 1960s technologically, and they've got hundreds of nuclear weapons between the two of them. Uh, what do you think a terrorist could do with some of these ICBMs? Or, or just a regular, a script kitty could probably hack into these systems and launch a nuke at the Vatican or something and cause a, the entire world society to simply melt down into chaos. Uh, this is probably going to happen in the future. I can't see many good outcomes coming from the fact that there are tens of thousands of nuclear weapons in this world. Yeah, there's over 10,000 of them in the uh, United States and Russia. And British have like uh, 200 of them. The French have about 300. Pakistan and India each have about 100. Israel's got supposedly anywhere from 50 to 100. North Koreans might have up to 10 crude uh, nuclear weapons. The Saudis supposedly have some. You've got all sorts of nuclear nations. The Chinese have 400 of them. These states are all unstable. Everything's destabilizing right now. Uh, the, no good can possibly come of the fact that nuclear weapons exist. So I think people need to show more restraint and stop with all the warmongering because you might get your wish. Uh, and it probably won't be quite as pretty and fun as Fallout 3. That's about all. Peace out.